Uh, my name is Jason Kibbe, and I am the CEO of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. We are hosting this event along with uh, ZDHC and Frank Michelle, whom you'll hear from in just a moment. Uh, before I start, I just want to take a moment to have a big thank you to our sponsors. I uh, just wanted to thank our platinum sponsor, Nike, and I saw Joey here a moment ago from Nike. A huge thank you to Nike for your support in this event and for everything that you guys do. Uh, a thank you to our gold sponsor, Cytex, a manufacturing uh, facility and real leader in Vietnam, led by Sanji Ball. And then our silver sponsor, Novazines. Uh, and then finally, I want to thank our, our bronze sponsor, Tuv Rhineland. Thank you so much for all of your support. Could we give a hand to our sponsors for today? Thank you. So just for those of you who don't know about the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, we are a diverse global membership that comprises brands, retailers, manufacturers, and other stakeholders that really represent the breadth of this value chain and all of the critical stakeholders that participate in it. We represent about 40% of the worldwide market here in, in, uh, in apparel and footwear. And our main tool is something called the Hig Index. The Hig Index is a suite of different tools and services and trainings, which you'll hear much more about today. Um, and unlike many tools, the Hig Index is actually built by manufacturers and brands and retailers all working together. So you'll hear more from Vidura in just a moment. Now, I also, I also know that many of you are suffering from tons and tons of audit fatigue. How many of you do more than five audits a year? Raise your hand, come on, I bet there's more than you, more than you that are doing that. So what we're trying to do at the Hague Index is really eliminate that and standardize for one of the tools that you'll hear a lot about, more about today, the facilities environmental module, we're trying to standardize that so that we can get rid of proprietary assessments that are held by the brands and move to a standard assessment. And in the spirit of that, we're co-hosting this event with ZDHC. And ZDHC, uh, the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals, and the Sustainable Apparel Coalition have been working together very closely over the last two years to, instead of having one ZDHC audit and one SAC assessment that we can work together. And that common product that we built together is the facility, facilities environmental module, which you'll hear a lot more about today. So this is the second time we've also co-hosted an event with ZDHC, and this is what we're trying to do much more of in the industry. Bring things together, collaborate, consolidate, so that there isn't so much confusion, there aren't so many programs, and when there are different programs that they're working together, you can come to one day and hear about several of them, and you can see that we're trying to make this easier and much more scalable for the manufacturing base to implement supply chain sustainability. So in that spirit, I want to introduce my friend and collaborator, Frank Michel, who is the Executive Director of ZDHC. Frank. Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah, my name is Frank Michel. I'm the executive director of ZDHC, Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals, and I want to endorse what Jason just said. Um, from our perspective, is uh, the audit fatigue one point, but also the synchronization of uh, reporting systems and requirements that you receive every day. Um, and you'll learn more about this this afternoon when we tap into the tool suite of uh, ZDHC and what about our MRSL and the upcoming gateway, what that means. What we want to make sure you, um, you take home with you today is um, that we want to put you in a position to proactively understand how the SAC and ZDHC tools blend in together, but also what you can do proactively to learn to measure where you start and that you have something that you can take on. So I wish you a really good and interesting day and we'll have a roundup session where Jason and I will answer questions and we open the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. And now I'm going to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Vidura Ralapanawe. And Vidura is the, uh, is the General Manager of Environmental Sustainability at MAS Intimates. 
He is based in Sri Lanka. Uh, he is also a real sustainability expert with a background in climate science, corporate communications, and communicate in strategy and change. His experience spans on a variety of different types of organizations, and he's worked very, very closely with the SAC, also really holding us accountable to make sure that the manufacturer's voice is represented, not in everything that we do, but that we're making tools that actually add value and help make manufacturers better companies. Uh, at MAS Intimates, he was a key player in the team that created the world's first carbon neutral bra. Who knew? <laughs> And in 2011, Vidura became the 11th cultural engineer at the Honda Dream Factory, which celebrates the UK's brightest innovators or cultural engineers for his work in sustainability. Without Vidura, future adieu, or further ado, Vidura. Thank you, Jason. Good morning. Um, so, I'm going to talk about why sustainability matters. Um, I've been working in the apparel industry for the last 10 years. I did a stint earlier as well. Um, and also, before I joined the apparel industry, I spent about six years of my life um, studying climate. Um, so, I have a very strong climate background. And I'm going to talk uh, also about climate change because um, it's important to the work that we are doing. Um, just a quick um, um, uh, piece about the picture that you see on the screen. Um, has anybody seen this picture before? Um, in Antarctica, there's an ice shelf called Larsen, and this is a crack that has come up. Um, and within the course of this year, uh, a giant iceberg the size of 6,000 square kilometers is going to carve out of the Antarctic. Um, and this is due to climate change. Um, so I'm going to talk more about why this matters. Um, because the challenges we face from a sustainability, especially from an environmental point of view, is unprecedented in human history. And it's important for us to know why we are working in this area of sustainability and what should drive our actions. And the argument is very simple. Quite a lot of our time as apparel manufacturers, what we used to do as sustainability was determined by what our customer brands asked us to do. And I don't think it simply is not enough. And what I'm trying to show to you today is why it's not enough and what is our course of action to move forward. So I'm 46 years old. Um, might not look like that, but um, <laughs> I'm going to actually talk about some of the things that actually happened um, from the time that I um, was born and up to now. Because during my lifetime, from 1970 to now, the world has lost 50% of all its wild animals. Now, during the same time, Earth's population actually doubled from 3.78 billion people to 7.3. So there's a bit of a correlation to this. And throughout the planetary history, there were five great extinctions, mass extinctions of species. And we are right now facing the sixth. And this is my lifetime, and it's our lifetime. This is the last male northern white rhino in the world. And what I want to show you is that this animal even though it's the last animal on the planet, actually has a 24-hour armed guard to save it from the poachers. This is the last animal in the planet of this species. It's going to die out because it's too old to procreate. During my lifetime, 500 million hectares of tropical forests disappeared. Now, there's a reason why tropical forests disappeared in this time because um, in, in Europe and US, most of the forests disappeared before I was born. 
So this is what's happening. And most of it is actually driven by um, um, palm oil. So um, scientists actually calculate something called an ecological footprint. And that is how much resources we as humans can use um, in a, at a level that the earth can regenerate itself. And the last time we lived within our own means was the year that I was born, 1970. Right now we are about 1.6. We are using resources at a rate of about 1.6. And if we keep consuming and increasing our consumption, we actually run out of resources. Now the problem with that is that, you know, we calculate all of this from a human point of view. You don't look at what the other animals want. The second picture on the side that you see is something called planetary boundaries, and it's asking about for us to survive and thrive in this planet. What are the things that we should not do? And a lot of the indicators around biodiversity, um, chemicals, is actually we've crossed all our thresholds. So this is not a good thing. And now we come to my more studied area, a problem called global warming. So from the pre-industrial time, to now, we've increased our temperature by about 1.34 degrees. And this is huge. This is significant. Um, we had an all-time high in last year's February. All of you would remember it. Um, most of the global temperature records got broken. Um, we had massive heat waves, even in Sri Lanka, which, has, uh, you know, which, which doesn't see a lot of climate extremes. Um, and here you see how much of a jump it is. And what I want you to remember is that in Paris Agreement last year, all the countries came together and said, we are going to stop global warming at two degrees. Okay? Now, two degrees is a kind of interesting concept because there is no scientific rationale based on it. Two degrees is what Europe wanted when small island nations came and begged in Copenhagen to say that don't do two degrees because in two degrees we will not exist. But that was not how it used to be. So what small island nations asked was we had to stop the warming at 1.5. If you look at this picture, we've already hit 1.5, because what this picture shows is from this zero line. But if you take from pre-industrial times, we've already crossed the threshold. Why does it matter? For the last 650,000 years, we have not had carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere this high. Imagine this. The whole of human civilization came to be in an era where carbon dioxide never exceeded even 300. Okay, is this bad? This is a picture of the North Pole. The small uh, device that you see is the marker, which marks the North Pole. Now I have two um, kids, um, and in their mind, North Pole is the most coldest place in the planet. When they were small, they thought Santa Claus was there. Um, it's where polar bears live. This picture was taken on 2012 April. Same year, in June, because North Pole is actually a lake during summer. And this is all due to global warming. Within a very short period of time, we will not have any ice left in North Pole in the summer. And it's already having significant impacts because sea level has been continuously rising. And in a lot of coastal areas in all over the world, it is no longer habitable due to the rising tide and sea level combination. Now, what we need to remember is as we talk about the global trends, it's also local. If you want to talk about Bangalore, last time I, was, I came to Bangalore was in 1996. The weather and climate of Bangalore was not what it is now. It was very temperate climate. It was very nice. I, enjoy, I remember staying outside most of the day. It was really nice, I think. But now it's different because on top of climate change, we have massive deforestation and industrialization. We have burning lakes. We have foam-filled lakes. This is not how it should be. Um, last year, we went and watched Finding Dory because my kids love this movie. This is Great Barrier Reef. Great Barrier Reef is the single largest living structure in the world, the most biologically diverse um, place you can find in, in, in the marine environment. This is what it looked like last year. Um, out of it, the top one third is actually dying. 
and it cannot be recovered in our lifetime and it will never be. In the history 